Good evening. Good evening, Deva. Good evening, Ernie. Good evening, Russell. We're glad to have you folks with us tonight. We thank the Lord that we can come to you live and in person with the ones that are with me here at Spirit of Life Ministries, right in the middle of the state of Florida in Sebring. We thank the Lord that he's with us tonight. We're going to pray for a minute because there's some bad weather out there. We'll pray for people that are driving. Father, we just pray right now for those that are out on the road, that you keep them safe from any bad weather. And we ask that you touch lives tonight as we break the bread of life. We thank you now. We praise you that we can come together and study the Word of God, and it will help us to understand where we are at in the timetable. How many of you realize that we're in the last days? I tell you, with everything coming together, we keep our eye on Israel. That's the main thing. We see what's happening there. We, I'm enjoying the study of Daniel. There's a little bit deep at times, and I want to give these out tonight so you have something to look at later. It'll help you. This is a little chart on the timetable in chapter 11. There's a lot of really interesting facts in here, and in order to understand the whole chapter, you need to go back and listen to part one that we had last two weeks ago, actually, because last Wednesday we celebrated America's birth. So we're going to be in chapter 11 tonight. We've been talking about four kings that were raised up that came in after Alexander the Great, and he didn't have a child to come in after him, so four kings took over, and the different kings did different things. Their war, and you know, there's always war over land. Think about what Hitler did. He wanted to control the world. He wanted to take over the whole world. And that spirit's been around a long time. And the one behind that spirit is Satan because he wants to control what's going on in people's lives. He'll send everything and everything your, anything and everything your way to try to discourage you and try to get you off track with the things of God. We're going to start with chapter 11, verse 29. Now, if you look at here, verse 27 says, Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. You see, folks, when God says it's time, no matter what anybody else has to say, it will be time. You can't change his timetable when it's meant to be, it'll be. And then at verse 28, then shall he return into his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So they're coming back into Israel. Verse 29 of chapter 11 of Daniel. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ship, ships of Chitam, pronounced Kittim, shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now it's interesting that the angel is telling these things to Daniel about what's going to happen. Let's talk about the appointed time. This time is established by God. Who establishes it? God. He's in control of the events taking place the establishment agreement of agreements between the children of Cleopatra, who started ruling together, caused Antiochus V to invade again. But things were different this time. These ships they talked about from Kittim. This time, however, Rome came to the aid of Egypt. The Hebrew word here is Kittia, which is translated Cyprus. The Septuagint 
translates the word as Romans. In 168 BC, Antiochus IV was met by the Romans who ordered him to leave Egypt immediately or be attacked by Rome. Roman Council Gaius Populacinus drew a circle around Antiochus IV and he demanded a decision before he stepped out of the circle. I'm telling you, he put it to him and he said, you're gonna make a decision now. Antiochus IV, being a captive in Rome from 189 to 175 BC, knew the power of Roman might. He retreated to his kingdom and planned on securing his borders against Roman power. Good evening, Martha. We're in the book of Daniel chapter 11 and we're reading verses 29 through 31. In that verse it says it's, he made and he has indignation against the Holy Covenant. Upset with his humiliation by the Romans, Antiochus IV determined to bring Jerusalem into his Hellenistic kingdom and he tried to destroy the Jewish faith. You see, if you don't get your way, you're gonna do what you wanna do. You're gonna get angry and you're gonna do your thing and that's what he's trying to do here. Now in that verse it says, he shall show regard. Now he along with some Jews tried to turn the temple in Jerusalem into a Greek temple. In 167 BC, that's before Jesus was born, he attached a body of troops to Jerusalem, that's Antiochus IV. They took the city by assault on the Sabbath, and they slaughtered many people and sacked the city. You see, on the Sabbath day, the Jews wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't fight, they wouldn't come against it because the law told them they weren't supposed to. Now, Jews were compelled under the penalty of death to depart from the laws of their fathers and cease living by the laws of God. Furthermore, the sanctuary in Jerusalem was to be polluted and called Jupiter Olympius. That comes out of the Book of Maccabees. And the Book of Maccabees is not in the King James Bible, but there's a lot we can learn about history through reading books other than just the Word of God. And they always come together. And of course, out of that came Hanukkah, where the lights were lit for those seven days in the temple without any oil running out. And Jesus went to the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah. So we can take what Maccabees had to say. And they went in there, and you know what? When this happened, almost everybody went along with it. This is what will happen with the Antichrist people. He'll set up something and make it look so good that even the elect could be fooled. And that's coming down the road sooner than we think with the Antichrist coming on the scene. That Antiochus IV was like an Antichrist. He went in there and he did what he did. Now, Josephus is a historian. Have anybody ever heard of Josephus? He has the works, there's books, you can read these things. But let's hear what he had to say about this. You see, history is theirs if we seek it out. And we learn from history. We learn everything that's going on now. God doesn't do anything new. We learn from what he's done. King Antiochus IV returned out of Egypt. This is what Josephus recorded. He returned out of Egypt 16 for fear of the Romans. He made an expedition against the city of Jerusalem. And when he was there, in the 143rd year of the kingdom of the Seleucids, he took the city without fighting. Wow, without fighting. Those of his own party opening the gates to him. And when he had gotten possession of Jerusalem, he slew many of the opposite party. And when he would plundered of it a great deal of money, he returned to Antioch. Now it came to pass after two years, in the 145th year, on the 25th day of that month, which is by us called Shasla, and now Josephus is writing this, and by the Macedonians of Pellas, in the 153rd Olympiad, that the king came up to Jerusalem, they're speaking of Antiochus now, and pretending peace, 
Isn't that what the Antichrist is going to do? He's going to say, peace, peace. The word of God says there'll be no peace. It says he pretended peace. He got possession of the city by treachery. At which time he spared not so much as those that admitted him into it on account of the riches that lay in the temple. But led by his covetous inclination. You see, people, the love of things, the love of money, the love of things was what made him do this. He saw there was a great deal of gold in the temple, many ornaments that had been dedicated to it of very great value. All of these things were in the temple. And in order to plunder its wealth, he ventured to break the league he'd made. In other words, he said he's coming with peace, but when he got there, let's see what it says. So he left the temple bare. He took away the golden candlesticks and the golden altar of incense and the table of showbread and the altar of burnt offering and did not abstain from even the veils which were made of fine linen and scarlet. He ransacked it. He also emptied it of its secret treasures and left nothing at all remaining. And by this means, cast the Jews into great lamentation. That means sorrow. For he forbade them to offer those daily sacrifices which they used to offer to God, according to the law. And when he pillaged the whole city, some of the inhabitants that he slew, and some he carried away captive, together with their wives and children, so that the multitude of those captives that were taken alive amounted to about 10,000. Horrible what he did. He also burnt down the finest buildings and when he'd overthrown the city walls, oh, Jerusalem had walls. Hello. He built a citadel in the lower part of the city for the place was high and overlooked the temple on which a county fortified it with high walls and towers and put, in into, put into it a garrison of Macedonians. In other words, he built a fort. And I believe that fort is what people are calling the wall in Israel. There isn't any wall standing that was part of the temple people. Jesus said every stone would be thrown down. But Antiochus came in and he built this fortress. That's what's left standing there. The temple was down by where David was at, down by the threshing floor. Anyways, that's what the scripture says. He put in a garrison Macedonians, but listen to this. However, in that citadel dwelt the impious and wicked part of the Jewish multitude, from whom it proved that the citizens suffered many and sore calamities, even their own brothers, sisters, their fellow Jews were causing more problems. And when the king had built an idol, altar upon God's altar, he slew a swine upon it, a pig. And so he offered a sacrifice neither according to the law nor the Jewish religious worship in that country. He did the worst possible thing that could happen. Put a pig on the altar. That's why they called it the abomination of desolation. He desolated that whole temple. He also compelled them to forsake the worship which they paid their own God and to adorn those whom he took to be gods and made them build temples and raise idol altars in every city and village and offer swine upon them every day. He also commanded them not to circumcise their sons and threatened to kill them if they did. I want to make an interjection here. Satan is always after the seed. He wanted to destroy, he wants to now even, destroy all Jews because that's where the lineage came down through with Messiah. He wanted to wipe them out. He took them out. He destroyed their city, took away their worship, took away their ability to bring sacrifice in, and don't think for a minute that's not going to happen. When a Bible teaching church teaches against sin and a government tells them they can't do it anymore, that situation is just like what happened here. It's coming. There's cities right now, they won't allow you even to have a Bible study in your house. There's countries right now, if you stand up against homosexuality, if you stand against gays, if you stand, and I don't mean the person, I'm talking about the sin. 
when they come against that they can be arrested now see these are the examples in the old testament for us to study so we can see where we're at your eyes would have to be blind if you don't see where we're at right now we're at the same place thank god right now god's given us a reprieve i don't think it's going to last the church isn't doing their job they're compromising the gospel they're not preaching against sin many many churches are feel good messages and that's what he did he went in there to change their ways so they become like the world isn't that what's happening in many many places that you go that's the truth now that was written by josephus at the time that this all happened he documented it wrote it down it's like hello read this wake up people let's read verses 32 now through 35 chapter 11 of Daniel and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits and they that understands among the people shall instruct many yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame by captivity and by spoil many days. And when they shall fall, they should be hoping with a little help. That word hoping means helped. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the end of the end, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Wow, let's see what they mean. It says those that do wickedly. The temple became a test for those in Israel. Those who aligned themselves with Antiochus showed their wickedness. People who know their God. The wickedness caused the faithful to make a stand in the days of Antiochus IV. Mattathias and his sons, known as the Maccabeans, rebelled against the policies of Antiochus and led a guerrilla war against the Greeks. Praise God, somebody stood up and did something. You may be a small voice. I may be a small voice. But when we put the word out and it changes one life, it's worth it. Can I get an amen? Amen. Matthias Matthiason's sons, known as the Maccabeans, rebelled against policies of Antiochus and led a guerrilla war against the Greeks. They were able to reestablish the temple practices. The temple was rededicated in a service that is known as Hanukkah, when the oil only enough for one day lasted eight. Excuse me, I said seven early, but it lasted eight days. Have you ever had something miraculously like that happen? I have. I've seen things like that where I didn't know how I was going to get some more and the gas just didn't run out in the car or food didn't run out. You went in and you kept making something. God is faithful to take care of his kids. We don't need to worry. We don't have to have fear. <laughs> Are you with me tonight? Hallelujah. Let's get a hallelujah for that. Amen. Amen. Lord. Mm. And it says, and they that understand. People will understand. Daniel 11 draws a contrast between two groups of people. Those who know God and understand the wicked who act against God. This line does not stop and the Maccabeans, but will continue to the end. Yes, it will. The pattern was set in Daniel chapter 8, and we are told about the coming abomination of desolation by Antiochus Epiphanes, who would desolate the temple. Back up in chapter 8, it says that. Antiochus is merely a picture. Good evening, Deborah. Glad to have you watching with us tonight. Antiochus is merely, we're in Daniel chapter 11, we're in verses 32 through 35. Antiochus is merely a picture of a future and greater desolator who's coming in the end of days. Antiochus is little, the Antichrist is big. Yet for many days, the time of Antiochus set the example for future Israel. Here we see the period of persecution. Good evening, Brad. The period of persecution is long and involves many days and many people. 
It says many shall join. During this time gap, many will make the choice of joining those who understand or joining those that are in rebellion against God. Wow. This period of time is one of refining where the people of God are made white by the trials of life. How many of you like trials in your life? I don't. But you know what? They purify us. The trials help us to come to find out what's really in us. Sometimes I find the things that are really in us aren't what I really wanted to be in there. How about you? Mm -hmm. They come to the surface so we can get rid of them. When they refine gold and silver, all the impurities through the heat come to the surface and the refiner will take all that stuff off of there until there's nothing left but pure gold. In our lives, we ask God to change us, and when we get changed, we wonder what in the world is going on. This purification process will continue till the end. The time of the end is a period covered from Daniel 11, verses 36 to 12, 2. At this point, Israel is reestablished after a long period of desolations. This gap in time is demonstrated in the iron legs and the iron and clay feet that break between Daniel and 926, the killing of Messiah, the destruction of the temple, and Daniel 927 when the temple is back in service. You see, the temple is destroyed more than one time. And Nehemiah and Ezra later go back to rebuild what Antiochus had destroyed. You see, it all comes together. And Daniel is being told what's going on and what's going to happen. See, God just doesn't keep us in the dark. He wants us to know. Recently, I had to make a decision on something, and I prayed. And when I got the peace on it, I knew what I was supposed to do. And when I did what I was supposed to do, all the stress and everything left me. Praise God, we can hear from the Holy Spirit. Anybody else have that? Can I have an amen? Amen. Now, I want to talk about the first period of time versus the second period. You may want to make a note. In Daniel chapter 2, it talks about the iron legs, or the iron and clay feet in the second period. The first period in Daniel 7 talks about the beast, and the second period also talks about a beast. In Daniel chapter 8, it talks about Antiochus IV, but when the second period of time comes, it's the Antichrist. So see, Daniel is a picture of what's going to happen later. It happened once, but it's happening again. That's why we study this at this particular time, because as we study it, it helps us to grow in faith to know where we're at on God's calendar. In Daniel chapter 9, in the first period, the temple was destroyed. And in the second period of time, there's going to be a temple rebuilt. We're all waiting for that. Now, it also says there, still for the appointed time. God is in charge of the pace of events. How many of you understand that? When you, when you try to figure it out yourself, there's no way you can understand it. Now, Daniel is divided into two parts. The first part of Daniel 11 talks about the abomination desolation with Antiochus. But the second part is going to go into more depth. Now we're going to talk about these two parts tonight. The first part covers from the Persian kingdom to the time of Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus IV attempted to transform Judah and Jerusalem into a Greek outpost of his kingdom on the border of advancing Roman power and he caused the revolt of the Maccabees. You know, somebody needs to get mad enough to stand up against the devil. Is it going to be you? How about it? You ever get tired of what it's going to do? You can make a difference. Good evening, Wesley. Glad to have you with us. In Daniel chapter 11, 31, the abomination of desolation is mentioned. In the desecration of the Jewish temple by the Antiochus IV, we're in Daniel chapter 11, Wesley, and we're at chapter, we're verses 31 on. Antiochus IV rededicated the Jewish temple as the temple to Zeus, picturing himself as the god on December 25th, 167 BC. Isn't that an interesting date? You see, 
The world takes things. Am I against Christmas? No, because Jesus was born. It's very likely he was born in the fall, but I, he wasn't born in December. But every day of the year I celebrate the birth of Christ in somebody's heart. How about you? Have you shared Christ with anybody lately to see that birth come in? Now, Antiochus destroyed the Jewish temple and this caused the Maccabean revolt. He rededicated the temple, but Mattathias was an older priest. He had five sons. He rejected Antiochus Epiphanes and he led guerrilla warfare and rebellion against the Greek system. One family. I know there's some of you think, well, what can I do to make a difference? You do what God tells you to do, and you can be the one that makes a difference. I want you to know, somebody witnessed to a little shoe, a shoe salesman in Chicago one time. A little shoe salesman. And that shoe salesman got saved. And he went to a church, and he started witnessing to street kids in Chicago. And he brought them to church. And they weren't very happy with these dirty little kids but he kept bringing them and bringing them and he built a Sunday school class and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that person was Dwight Moody. If you ever heard of Moody Bible College, it all started because some little woman witnessed to him. He got saved and look what he did. You don't know, Deborah, what you can do in somebody's life by making a difference and you too, Ernie. You just don't know. Don't ever worry about it. Just be God in action in your life. But when his sons died, Manatheus, they continued the struggle along with those that rejected the Greek pagan culture. This included a group known as the Hasidians, H-A-S-I-D-E-A-N-S. -E that means the righteous ones. And they strictly followed the laws of Moses. Many died in the struggle. Don't think it's going to be easy. God never said it was going to be easy. Was it easy for him to go to the cross? Good evening, Melissa. It wasn't. We're in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Many died in the struggle, the Maccabeans. But in December 164 BC, the Maccabeans were able to capture the temple and rededicate it to serve God. Hallelujah! One family raised up the sons and that one family came against that Antiochus Epiphanine spirit, that Antichrist spirit and they got the temple back. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, one for Jesus. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Okay, they rededicated the temple to serve God. Now Antiochus Epiphanes, that's Antiochus IV, was in the east conducting war against the Elamites. He went insane on hearing the success of the Jews against his armies in Jerusalem and died. Ha! Devil's got his day coming. This rededication of the temple is known as Hanukkah. How many of you ever heard the Hanukkah? It's the Feast of Dedication. And Jesus was in Jerusalem for it. Turn to John chapter 10, verse 22. Keep your finger in, Daniel. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Praise God, somebody stood up and made a difference. John chapter 10, and we'll, read, we'll be reading verse 22. It says, and of course, John chapter 10 is Jesus says, The thief cometh but for to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I am come that you have life. He's been teaching. But verse 22 says, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. When is Hanukkah? In the winter, at the Feast of Dedication. So Jesus was there. It is mentioned, Hanukkah, in the New Testament. It's called the Feast of Dedication. Back to Daniel. In Daniel 11, verses 32 through 35, this covers the time in the Maccabean Rebellion against the pagan Greek culture. This struggle, and you know, you can use your Bible as a workbook you can take a little line on these verses so you can understand which part of it is from that period of time and which part of it goes into later period of time. Verses 32 through 35, you can make a little line, cover the time of the Maccabean Rebellion against the pagan Greek culture. 
this struggle between those who know their God and those who do wickedly would continue until the end of time. It's still going on, isn't it? Antiochus IV was a type of the coming end time, the world leader. The Maccabean rebels were a type of the righteous Jews who would reject the end times ruler and thus bring his last days of Saul and Israel, resulting in the coming of the Messiah. So see what God's showing is what's happening then is going to happen again. Now, I've heard people say, I don't know how people can be so evil. Well, I tell you what, the word of God says there's none righteous. No, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. It's the spirit in people, that antichrist spirit. You're either for Jesus or against him. There is no middle road with God. You're either for him or against him. You ride the middle road, he calls that lukewarm, and it says he'll spit you out of his mouth. In Daniel verses 11, 36, in chapter 12, verse 2, we emerge from out of our time tunnel into the end of days with the final king of the Gentile world in charge and Israel in a very similar situation. Let's read Van Daniel eleven thirty six. Good evening, Jackie. Eleven thirty six, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Now what does that mean? The king shall do. The king here is the future king at the end of time. So starting with verse 36, we're looking towards the end times that we're living in right now. He is the last king of the Gentile powers, the final king before the return of Messiah. The king is ruler of the kingdom pictured as the iron and clay toes in Daniel 2.44. Let's look at chap chapter 2, verse 44. Back up a few pages, Daniel 2.44. It says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Oh, don't you look forward to the day when the king of kings rules. Yes. Amen? Amen. Now this king, he's the little horn of Daniel 7, who uproots three of his fellows. Let's look here at Daniel 7, verse 8. Daniel 7, verse 8. It says... I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. All right, now let's read verse 11. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now read verse 19 of chapter 7. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was different or diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Wow, that sounds like a rough one. Now verses 23 through 26. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first. He shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, that's against God, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, that's you and me, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times, but the judgment shall sit 
and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Wow. The future king, all right, let's read verses 24 and 25 again. The ten horns of this kingdom are ten kings. The future king, pictured in Daniel chapter 8, foreshadowed by Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, by desecrating the future temple. Look at chapter 8, verse 23. It says, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. This end times king is also referred to in Daniel chapter 9 as the prince to come a descendant of the armies which destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70. He guarantees Israel's right to rebuild the third temple with a seven-year agreement and breaks the agreement and desecrates the temple at the midpoint. Isn't that what Antiochus did? He came back and he said that he was going to do all these things and make peace, and then in the middle of it, he changes his mind and killed everybody. That's what's going to happen with the, with the Antichrist. People are going to look at him and say, oh, this person's bringing peace. He's doing all that. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. It says, In the vision of the evening, excuse me, I'm in the wrong place, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Hallelujah. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. There are three competing views on this section of scripture that we just read. In Daniel 11, go back there again. We're going to read these first. We're going to read these verses 36 through 44, and then we're going to talk about the three different views. Daniel 11:36, and the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself, and magnifying himself above every god, shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces, and a God of whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Hmm, it's divided right now, isn't it? And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, that's Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans, and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make, make away many. Now, these are the three competing views on these verses. The first is that, it's that it is further historical or prophetic account fulfilled 
in Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes. The second, that it's wishful thinking by the author of Daniel, which does not correspond to history. The third, that it's prophecy yet to be fulfilled. The first view does not correspond with Antiochus IV's historical events. What's the first view again? That it was a prophetic word that was fulfilled in him. All right. After the abomination of desolation on Daniel 11, 31, Antiochus IV never defeated Egypt because a Roman power stopped him and let alone he didn't defeat the Libyans or the Ethiopians. Secondly, it contradicts the liberal's own position where it's Daniel's wishful thinking because in the first place, the accuracy of this chapter is because it was authored during the Maccabean period denying its supernatural nature. Yet the author was wrong on the last part because he did not have command of the facts. Now the third view holds to be the futurist view that the king is the last king, the end time ruler. According to Jerome's commentary on Daniel, the Jews in Jerome's day saw this individual as a future ruler yet fulfilled. Now, Jerome was a commentator back in the early Bible days, around the same time that this was going on. Let's hear what he has to say. The Jews believe, this is his quote, that this passage has reference to the Antichrist. Good evening, David, Devin. This refers to the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 11, alleging that after the small help of Julian, a king is going to rise up who shall do according to his own will and shall lift himself up against all that is called God, and shall speak arrogant words against the God of gods. He shall act in such a way as to sit in the temple of God, and shall make himself out to be God, and his will shall be prospered until the wrath of God is fulfilled. For in him the consummation will take place. We too understand this to refer to the Antichrist. That's what Jerome wrote. Now, the word according in there, what follows from verse 36 to 39 are descriptive qualifiers about this end time ruler. First, we find he acts according to his own will. He is the fulfillment of the Nebuchadnezzar dream, humanism taken to its logical conclusion. Man acting according to his own will, not the will of God or any deity but his own. Then it says he'll magnify himself. Like Antiochus IV, this king will make himself the focus of the world. This is in keeping with the nature of man. Antiochus IV installed an image of Zeus in the temple of Jerusalem, which looked like himself. According to the book of Revelation, this is exactly what this is going to happen with the Antichrist in the future in the third temple, except rather than Zeus, it will be the image of himself. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. And I have, after we go through this, we're probably going to close for the night because this is so rich. It's just taking, it'll take too much for you to take it all in tonight. Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to read verse 14 and 15. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell in the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You see that image is right there, the image of himself. And we're going to, just a couple more verses here and we'll close for the night. Blasphemies, God of gods, Another characteristic of this man is his hostility to the God of Israel. He will hate Israel. The God of Israel is God of gods, Jehovah God, Elohim, the God that is more than enough. The hostility toward the God of Israel reflected in Antiochus IV is ultimately fulfilled in the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, 6, it says, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle in them that dwell in heaven. He will have success for a period of time. It says he'll prosper. The Hebrew word is tshalak, 
means to rush, to advance, to prosper, make progress, succeed, be profitable. He's going to look good, and the world's going to follow him because of it. Oh, he'll suck him right in. He will be unstoppable until the determined time is complete. The period of his prosperity is specifically stated as a period of 42 months or 1260 days or three and a half years. He will persecute the death and prosper until the period established by God runs out. The next week we're going to go on. We only have one more verse, but there's a lot of rich meat in it. But before we leave, I'd like to pray for each one of you. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you give us your word. It even says in Daniel that this would be, be kept until the end times, that revelation would come and knowledge would come. And I thank you, Lord, that you're enlightening us with your word. You're teaching us where we're at. And thank you for that. I ask that you bless each one that listens to this, that you can open their hearts to receive and understand so that we can grow in your knowledge, grow in wisdom, and be prepared for what's coming ahead. Bless each one tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.